everyone's favorite concept, good old slope. So I'm trying to entice you into getting interested here, and so I'm giving you a challenge. And this first screen here, this problem is a challenge problem. Let's see if you can figure it out. Um, remember, that is our recurring theme this year, um, and it involves slope. So here's the deal. You've got these different, um, you got this red triangle, got this green one, you got this green shape, and you got this red orange shape. And the deal is that I want to know how is it that I can shift it all around and end up with a missing piece. And the key here is to learn what we're learning in this video and then see if you can use that to figure out why we end up with a missing piece. So let's start talking about slope, the steepness of a line. Slopes or steepness of lines, it's seen everywhere. A couple of um, real world examples follow here. The steepness of a roof of a house is called the pitch of the roof by home builders. The, um, the more snowy a region is, the, the, the more drastic the pitch on the roofs of the dwellings will be. That way the snow can come off. Because if you have a flat roof and it snows real heavy, your roof can cave in. Um, something just to think about in terms of um, how, how buildings are built. So the steepness of the roof is called the pitch of the roof by home builders. So that's an example of slope in the real world. Engineers refer to the slope of a road as the grade. If you've ever driven out um, through uh, West Virginia, you know there's a lot of mountains between Virginia and West Virginia when you cross over. Um, and there actually will be signs on the side of the road that are like caution trucks. This is too high a grade. They have to actually shift into a lower gear so that they don't just barrel you right over if your little itty bitty car is in front of one of them big 10, you know, 18 wheeler trucks. So the grade of the road is the slope of that road. They often refer to it as a percentage. An 8% grade, I guess, would be 8 out of 100. So that might be a rise of 8 feet for every 100 feet down. That's pretty steep. And if you're a big, big, big truck, it's going to be hard to get your brakes going with that. So you sometimes end up, um, like, you can't slam on the brakes, but you got to be real careful. You have to ride your brake, maybe, all the way down the incline. So that percentage is an example of something you might see on signs. That's actually a slope. And another way to think about slope is to think about it as rate of change. So in a real world example, we can think of the rate of change as the change in the dependent variable over the change in the independent variable. And we write it as a ratio or a fraction and we simplify it. So let's look at this example here in the table. Number of days and then the rental charge of the computers. So let's look at the rate of change. To do that, you're gonna look at any one of these points after the first one. Let's look at this one right here and go to a previous one, and you're gonna look at the change in the dependent variable, and the rental charge does indeed depend on the number of days you use it, so there's the change, 90 minus 60, divided by the change in the independent variable, and the number of days is indeed the independent variable, because the number of days you have the computer determines the charge of renting the computer. So 90 minus 60 is 30, three minus one is two, we get 15, and so the rate of change, what does it mean? Well, it means the rate of change for this circumstance is $15 per, so dollars is the dependent variable um, unit, because it was rental charge, so it's dollars, per day, per one day. And the number of days, that was our d independent variable unit. So what does it mean? It means that there's a difference of $15 per day for the charge of using the rental computer. So is the charge for using, yeah, not for the number, for F-O-R, sorry. For using the rental computer. Sorry for my messy handwriting. Okay, so that's rate of change. Let's do a couple of examples with rate of change in uh, another context. All right. At three weeks old, a corn plant is four inches tall, and at 15 weeks, it's 46 inches tall. So first, let's identify independent and dependent variable here. So the independent variable is the time in weeks, because the time is what is going to determine the height of the corn plant, and the dependent variable is the height of the plant. So it's change in dependent over change in independent. 
So it went from 4 to 46 inches. So we subtract bigger minus smaller. And then we'll do later minus earlier. So 46 minus 4 over 15 minus 3. 46 minus 4 is 42. 15 minus 3 is 12. Okay, so let's simplify that fraction. 42 over 12, let's divide them both by 6, leaving me 7 over 2, which is 3 and a half. And let's go ahead and make it a decimal, 3.5. Now, let's, what does that mean? Again, let's put the units on it. So it's independent or dependent over independent units. Dependent over independent. So it's inches per week. How many inches per week is it changing? 3.5. So the rate of change is 3.5 inches per week. That's how fast it's growing. Next one. After driving for four hours, Tom is 82 miles from home. And after driving for seven more hours, Tom is... 244 miles from home. Okay, again, let's determine independent and dependent variable here. So first of all, we have our independent variable. So what determines the distance? Does the time determine the distance? Does the distance determine the time? Well, in this case, they're telling us he drives this much and goes this far. So the independent variable is the time, and the dependent variable is the distance. Okay, and the time was in hours and the distance was in miles. I should have mentioned that on the other side here. If you're writing this part down, it will make it easier to find the unit at the end of the rate of change. So the distance first, 244 minus 82, and that's seven hours versus four hours of driving. When I subtract that, we get 162 over three. That is divisible, uh, three goes into 16, five times with one left over, so 54, and then put your units on it, dependent per independent, miles per hour, well that sounds familiar, MPH, that's what you see on a speed limit sign. So what does that rate of change represent? It represents the speed that Tom was driving on average, 54 miles per one hour. Just like if we go back here, this represents the rate of change at which the plant was growing, 3.5 inches per one week at a time. Now let's take slope and let's look at it in a different way. Instead of rate of change, let's look at it as um, the rise over the run. And so this is another way we look at slope. So rise over run. And you can take and find the vertical change. And the rise is the vertical change. Okay, the vertical change from one point to another. And then the run, that's the horizontal change from one point to another. So when we find rise over run, that's what we're talking about, vertical over horizontal. And that's the steepness of a line. Now, we use the variable m for slope because of the French verb monter, which is to go up. And it's an ER verb, and I believe that is a standard ER verb, French students, so you could actually conjugate it just using your regular ER verb um, endings. Um, and please don't ask me if I remember them because I totally don't, even after four years of French in middle and high school. Anyway, don't tell Halbach. Because the slope is a ratio where there are no units in the ratio, let's look at why that is with this particular problem. So let's look at this one. You have in here that it's a rise of five centimeters over a run of nine centimeters. And if you think about units as numbers that can cancel, centimeters over centimeters cancels. So when we describe the slope of this particular line that we have, this line right here that I just copied in green, it's five ninths. That's the steepness of that line, five over nine. Rise of five, run of nine. You can use a formula if you have two ordered pairs, and what we do is we label them, the ones and the twos. It doesn't matter which point you give the ones and which point you give the twos, because the ratio of those differences will be equal regardless of which point gets used first. So let's try it with um, a couple of problems. All right, now in these two problems, we have the slope written because we have the rise and the run. So let's do that first, and then we'll go back and use the ordered pair method as well. So the first thing we do here is we recognize that we have a rise of 3 and a run of 5. 
So if I'm writing the slope rise over run, um, excuse me, not five, nine, three over nine. So rise of three, run of nine. Simplify it, and the slope of that line is one third. Now that's awesome if you always have a graph, but you are not always going to have a graph. So let's look at what those two ordered pairs are. The first one is 4, 6, and the second ordered pair is 13, 9. We can get the same answer, the same ratio here, using a slope formula. So say that I didn't have the graph, say that they didn't give me the graph. Here, I'll make it go away. Oh, I don't know if I can. No, I can't, because it's all one slide. So pretend there's no graph. Here, we'll cover it up. I'll cover it up with a nice, with a nice box here. Mm. Ah, no graph. All you have is ordered pairs now. So, y minus y over x minus x. So if we call this x1, y1, and x2, y2, it's y minus y over x minus x. And that gives me 3 over 9, which is indeed 1 third. So I get the same answer whether or not I use rise over run with an image or if I use two ordered pairs and find a slope. Now obviously you're not always going to have a graph and no, you can't have graph paper every time. So you are going to have to be able to graph using, or excuse me, find slope using two ordered pairs. Okay, let's try it with the next one. Again, we may know the rise over run. So in this case, rise of negative 5 over run of 7. Oh, well that's new. It's a negative slope. Well, what's the fundamental difference between these two things here? Let me delete this um, black box. So I got my slope as negative 5 sevenths on this second one. So this one is a negative slope and this one's positive. What's the fundamental difference between these two blue lines? This blue line is uphill and this blue line is downhill. And we'll summarize that in a minute with um, a different slide. Let's go ahead through and do the ordered pairs as well for this one. So the first ordered pair is 4, 10. And the second ordered pair is 13, 5. 13, 5. So it's y minus y. Notice I'm using the first one this time as the first one. And then x minus x. And as long as you keep it consistent, the top and the bottom, then you should be fine. We get 5 over... I did something wrong. Hold on. Oh, that's not 13. It's 11. It's 11, LeCompte, not 13. Sorry, folks, if you thought you caught a mistake, I caught it first. Okay, 4 minus 11 is negative 7. And then again, 5 over negative 7 is the same thing as negative 5 sevenths. And that is our slope, which is the same thing we got over here. All right, now these are a little bit different. Here we have a horizontal line, a horizontal line, and here we have a vertical line. Now they have specialized slopes and we're going to do it by actually doing rise over run here and by using ordered pairs. So the rise here would be zero because we're not going up at all to go from one point to the next. So there's no rise and the run is seven. Zero divided by seven is zero. So the slope of this line is indeed zero. Now if I think in terms of the ordered pairs, I have two ten and nine ten. And if you use the slope formula, it's y minus y over x minus x. So y minus y in this case would be 10 minus 10 on the top, and there's our 0. x minus x could be 2 minus 9 or 9 minus 2. It wouldn't matter because 0 on the top still gives me a 0 slope. And we'll watch a goofy uh, video in class to help us remember that that's going to be a 0 slope. How about this one? This time we have a rise of 6. And a run, we don't move to the right or the left over zero. Well, that is not equal to zero. Do not write down a zero for that. That is what we call undefined. So this line has an undefined slope. That vertical line has an undefined, undefined slope. And again, we can use our ordered pairs. So our ordered pairs are, are 4, 5 and 4, 11. Okay, so y minus y, so 11, whoops, sorry guys, 11 minus 5, y minus y over x minus x, and that gives me 6 over 0, which again is undefined. We can also say that this line has no slope at all. So you have a slope of 0, and you have no slope at all. All right, so let's summarize a little bit here. So uphill line has a positive slope. A downhill line has a negative slope. 
a horizontal line, and let's write in there that that's horizontal. A horizontal line has a slope of zero, and a vertical line, V-E-R-T-I-C-A-L, has a slope that is undefined or no slope at all. And that's all she wrote for slope. So we will look at lots and little things in class. We'll practice with this. I promise if you're confused, we'll do our best to make sure that it starts to clear up and get easier. See you guys in class.